All right, well, we're continuing our series, His Love, His, His Light, His Life. And we are now in the third chapter of 1 John. And I want to just give you a clue about a preview of coming attractions, if you will. I love to color code. As you know, I love my colors. So uh, today we're going to be looking at two different groups. We're going to be seeing believers and deceivers. Now, the believers will be highlighted in green, and the deceivers will be highlighted in red. And you say, why? Why are we doing this? Well, let me tell you, without distinguishing between believers and deceivers, we can get pretty messed up in this epistle. And in fact, that is one of the main reasons that John is writing this epistle. He is writing it to them so that they will be able to distinguish and discern between the believers and the deceivers. So let me just share a few words here. I mean, you're going to hear things about uh, no one can keep on practicing sin if they're born of God. And then you're going to hear about people who are born of the devil. They're still children of wrath. They're not born again. And you're going to hear all kinds of language about love and hate and light and darkness. All of this is what we see in 1 John. So if you are under the delusion that somehow this is a blend of the two groups. There is, no, there is no middle group. There is no third group here. In, in fact, his entire purpose is to distinguish between those who are in Adam and those who are in Christ, those who are in the flesh and those who are in the spirit, those who are not born of God and those who are born of God, born from above with a brand new spirit, a brand new nature. So with this in mind then, we're going to launch into this chapter looking at believers versus deceivers. All right, well first he says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know him. Now, from the very first verse here, you can see why it's going to be important to make this correct divide. I mean, the Apostle John is celebrating the incredible love that God has for us. I think he's blown over by it. I think he is, he is just amazed by it because he pauses. He pauses and he says, and such we are. It dawns on him. He realizes it. It suddenly hits him. The light bulb goes on. And he, he's sort of saying, are you kidding me? I mean, are you, are you serious? That we are born of God? That we literally get that heart transplant? That we literally get that DNA exchange? Are you kidding me? Wow, what a privilege. We are children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world, that is the deceivers, not the believers, but the deceivers, they don't know us, they don't recognize us, they try to label us and dismiss us, they try to categorize us, they tell us that what we have is a crutch, a religious crutch. They don't get it. They don't see their problem. They think that the issue is morality and ethics. It is not the issue. The issue is death and life. And we must be transferred out of death into life. You can have a spiritual corpse who changes their behavior, and yet they are still dead. It is not about morality and ethics. It is a death-life issue. And it is life that we receive in Jesus Christ. But the world doesn't get it. They didn't recognize him. They don't recognize us. They just can't comprehend the truth. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. Because we will see him just as he is. Resurrection eyes. You know, I don't know what we will be. I can't quite describe it, John is saying. We'll have resurrection hands and resurrection feet, new arms and new legs, resurrection body. Maybe we'll be exactly like Jesus was at his own resurrection, walking through walls, ascending into heaven. 
all kinds of guesses about exactly what we will look like. But he says, it's not appeared yet what we will be. But now, do you see the now? Don't be asking the how, be focused on the now. Don't be asking, how is God going to do it? What are we going to look like? What's it going to be like? And thinking off far into the future. Sure, that's, that's worth a thought now and then, but we don't have details. Instead, instead of being fixated on the how is God going to do it all, we need to be fixated on the now because there is a truth right now that is powerful, that is in our face, that is awesome. And here it is. Right now, we are children of God. We don't have to be waiting to be born of God. We don't have to wait for a new nature. We don't have to wait for a new heart. We don't have to wait to be united with Christ. We are one with Him right now. So the celebration begins today. And tomorrow, it will be the same. The celebration is how close is your Jesus? He is one with us. You can't get any closer than one. Paul says anyone who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. We got Christians all over the Bible belt and beyond. We're trying to get close to God. How are you going to get close to God? Through my devotions. No, you don't get close to God through your devotions. It was His devotion to you that caused you to be close to Him forever. He purchased your closeness. It was the cross and the resurrection. It is great that we look into the Scriptures. We're doing it right now. But we need to remember that early church, that 80% of them were illiterate. They couldn't have devotions. They didn't have their quiet time. They didn't have a formula for getting close to God. They had a public reading of the Scriptures, and it was just a reminder that they were already one with Christ because of what Jesus did, His devotion, not our devotion. We need to see this. There is nothing richer, there is nothing truer than God's Word. It is awesome. I'm addicted to God's Word. I love it. I crave it. But it is not logging time in a book that makes us close. It is the resurrection life of Jesus fused to our life that makes us close. When we appear, we will be like Him. Are you kidding me? We're going to be like Him? We will see him just as he is, face to face, no fuzziness, no lack of clarity, resurrection eyes to match, get this, to match the resurrection heart that we already have. Yeah, that's worth a woo-hoo. That was kind of a wimpy woo-hoo. I feel like we need a global woo-hoo. Yeah, yeah. Now we're getting charismatic in here. Uh huh. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Jesus Christ purifies himself just as he is pure. What is this about? It's a behavior passage, it's about our thoughts and our actions. In other words, if you're born of God, we get to act like it. If we're born of the Spirit, there's a new way to walk. If we are in the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So new resurrection thoughts hit the, the screen of our mind. We have the option to think the old way or think the new way. We have the option of acting and reacting the old way or acting and reacting the new way. God calls this the renewing of the mind, right? We're experiencing a renewal, the software updates. There's downloads every day. You can click out of them if you want. You can X out of them and say, remind me later, Lord. Or you can hit that download button and say, yes, Lord, yes, and receive that new thought for a new day. Everyone who has this hope fixed on Jesus purifies himself just as Jesus is pure. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Perhaps this verse, verse 4, is the first verse where we see that the utter necessity of distinguishing between believers and deceivers. If I don't understand that this is John's intent, then I am going to sit back 
not being in the know, not recognizing his purpose and context, and I'm going to say, huh, well, I mean, occasionally, I mean, I kind of, I practice sin sometimes, so I guess I'm not saved, you see? You see, so the word practice then, the word practice trips us up, and we begin thinking, well, there's a gray area. There must be three groups. There must be deceivers and believers, and then other people who kind of, kind of sin sometimes. What we need to recognize is that the Apostle John sins. He commits sins. Um, he says in a, in a place elsewhere in the same epistle, he says, if any of us does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. So he knows that believers sin. He was friends with his good buddy, James. James says, we all stumble in many ways. So clearly, Christians still commit sins. So what is this about? Is this about sinless perfection in our performance? No. What this is about is a trend reversal at salvation. But for the unbeliever, they can only wake up and practice sin. They can practice good-looking sin. They can practice bad-looking sin. They can practice well-adjusted sin. They can practice philanthropic sin. They can practice generous-looking sin. They can practice all kinds of flavors of sin. It's like Baskin-Robbins, right? There's 31 flavors of flesh here. All right, so all kinds of unbelief can be expressed. It can be someone trying to earn their righteousness and look good. It can be someone who has adopted principles of ethics and morality. There is good-looking sin out there. Because if it's not of Jesus, it's sin. That's what we need to understand. That everything that is not of faith in Christ is sin. So I can give a million dollars and it's sin. Or I can give a million dollars and it could be of faith. I could, I could uh, preach, and it could be sin. I could preach, and it could be of Christ. There are people, Jesus even names these people. He calls them out. And he says, many will say to me, look at all my preaching. Look at all my miracles. Look at all my exorcisms. Look at all the stuff I've done for you. And he'll say, actually, we never, we never connected. Actually, I never knew you. Actually, you never knew me. Actually, we were never, never one. So we need to see then that there are two practices in the world. There is the practice of the unbeliever, and it is chaotic and lawless. You say, does that mean Moses? Does that mean they need Moses? No, that means that the law of the spirit of, of life in Christ Jesus needs to set them free. It is the law of life in Jesus that sets them free from the law of sin and death. But right now, their practice is chaos and lawlessness, and there's no connection to Christ. And so what John is doing here is he is contrasting that with what it means to be in Christ. And if you are in Christ, I hope you get this, if you are in Christ, you are no longer dead in your sins. You are no longer dead and you are no longer in your sins. But we use this verbiage all the time. We say, have you heard about Mary? Have you heard about Lisa? Have you heard about Jill or John or whoever? Have you heard about them? Yeah, they're, they're a believer, but they're in sin. <laughs> yeah, they're in sin. No, they're not in sin. They're in Christ. You see, they're no longer dead in their sins. They might be sinning, but they're sinning while they're in Christ. They're not in darkness. They're sinning, but they're sinning while they're in the light. And that's why, no matter who it is, the, if they're in Christ, that light, that light is going to make that sin obvious and apparent to them. And their heart will crave that something deeper, something richer that is our destiny in Jesus. You know that He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. So if you see somebody that wakes up every day and all they want to do is practice sin in order to get better at sin, in order to get to the final four of sin, well, then that's probably a clue that they are not of God. Go Texas Tech, right? Yeah. 
They're practicing. You better believe they're practicing basketball right now. They're practicing every day, all day long, I bet. They're thinking, they're strategizing in order to be experts in the game of basketball in order to win another game and another, and well, maybe another, and then, wow, be champion basketball players. That is their practice. If it is our practice to wake up and crave sin and strategize about sin and, and we want to get better at sin so that we can be world champions at sin, then that's a clue that we're not born of God. But if we are struggling along with sin and we need help and we need counsel and we need growth because our heart is stirring and he who began a good work is carrying us on to completion and there's a battle inside, that's a clue that you're saved. But if there is no battle you're lost. If there is no battle of any kind, you do not have Christ in you. What's the solution? Get Christ. <laughs> Open the door of your life. Invite Him in. Get life. The core of your being is the problem. And that core needs to be exchanged with His life. No one who abides in Jesus sins. No one who sins has seen Him or knows him. All right, so what is this saying? Again, it's the same thing. We just saw the word practice. Now what we're seeing is a contrast between lost and saved. The lost is in red. The saved is in green. What does the word abide mean? I grew up with the messed up version of the word abide. I was waking up on Monday and I was trying to abide. And then I was waking up on Tuesday and thinking, well, I kind of did a good job abiding yesterday. I hope I can abide today. Abide became trust for me. And trust became abide. And so abide became a work. Abide became a performance. Abide became an idea about how focused am I on Jesus today. Now that's all fine and good if there is no scripture. But when you come to the scripture and see the word abide... What we figure out pretty quick is that abide is an in or out situation. There's no gray area. Abide is all or nothing. You either abide in Christ or you don't. In fact, in the Gospel of John, we see Jesus saying, if you don't abide in him, you are like a branch that is burned, right? Are we going to be burned? No, we're in Christ. We live in him. Abide just means live. Let me say that twice. Abide just means live. And with that in mind, we see what he's doing here. If we live in Christ, then we can't keep on keeping on in the practice of sin and love it because we're born of God. And that's why he even goes on to say this, no one who sins has seen him or knows him. So this is about, get this, this is about, do you not know him? Or do you know him? Have you not seen him? Or have you seen him? Do you not live in him? Or do you live in him? Do you see this? This is lost and saved. There's no middle ground. Little children, make sure that none of these deceivers deceive you. The one who practices righteousness, that's the new practice. Waking up every day with that new heart. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. So please understand, I know we can get neurotic about this. We Christians can get analytical and neurotic and introspective and look at passage like this and go, am I saved, am I saved, am I saved, am I saved? And we're looking at all our works. We're walking through life backwards. We're trying to run the Christian race backwards. We're looking at our feet. How am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? Am I saved? Am I saved? You can't run the race like that. The way to run the race is to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And he authored it. And get this, he is perfecting it. it it's not perfect. Our, our performance is not perfect. But I want you to see what he's saying here. If you've got the new heart, if you've got the new practice, then you are as righteous as Jesus. If you've got the new heart and you've got the new practice birthed in you, then you are as righteous as Jesus Christ is righteous. 
No, 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 no. I don't read my Bible much. That's what we might say. No, I don't go to church. I've only been a Christian. We, we go to the age that we've been a believer. We go to how much we've been in a building. We go to how much we've read a book. We think it's a, about being literate and reading and attending. It's about being placed in Jesus. And if you are placed in Jesus, you are as righteous as Jesus Christ, even as you sit in your chair today. People will not say this. They shy away from it. They think it is blasphemy. They say things like, well, yeah, in Christ. And we shove it over there in the corner in the in Christ category, which to most of us means, oh, later in heaven that'll be true. Oh, that's just positional. Oh, that's not real. Oh, that's just Bible talk. Oh, that's just symbolism. Oh, that's just allegory. That's just... You know, exaggeration, that'll be true later, but right now, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. No, no, you cannot say I'm a dirty, rotten sinner and say I'm born of God at the same time. Are you saying God gave birth to a dirty, rotten sinner? He didn't. He gave birth to a holy, righteous saint. We are born of God, born of the Spirit, and that changed who we are. Yeah, I second that. No one who is born of God practices sin. I love this because God's seed lives in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. So then, you know, you got some guys who take one verse out of context and they run over here and develop a theology that says Christians never sin again. That Christians never commit a sin again. Now let me say that that is foolishness. Because we can go through all the epistles of the New Testament and practically in all of them we can see behavior passages, warnings about attitudes and actions. Uh, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Don't offer your bodies to sin. Don't sin. And if you see a brother or sister who's struggling, restore them with gentleness. Be careful lest you too stumble in the same thing. Clearly, we Christians still sin. But what I'm afraid is happening with these who go off the reservation, build this other theology, is their confidence, get this, their confidence begins to be in their performance. It is so important for them to say that they never sin because that is their righteousness. But we don't have a works righteousness. We don't have a righteousness based on behavior anyway. And because we are righteous, let's admit our sins. Because we are forgiven and cleansed, let's be real and transparent about our struggles. Building a theology of I never sin is a defense mechanism in order to gain a status of righteousness that a believer already has. And so, no one who is born of God keeps on keeping on. The trend has been reversed. He is at work. There's a mind renewal. There's a process. Why? Because God's seed abides in us. You know what that means? DNA change. You're in the family. A new lineage. A new heritage. Born of God. By this, see, this is what I'm trying to say. This verse explains it all. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Now, we could again turn around, look at our performance, go, am I loving, am I loving, am I loving, am I loving? You see, that's what we want to do as neurotic Christians, we want to turn around and examine our love. Have I loved enough? Has it hit level seven? Am I at level nine yet? Or am I still hovering in level six? Maybe level six is not saved. You see what we do? We self-inspect. We need to keep in mind the Apostle John here is talking about haters of Christians. Haters. Okay? In the next few verses, we're going to see love contrasted with hate. Do we have an inborn love for the body of Christ or do we hate God's church? That's where he's going with this. 
So you'll notice the word obvious, and that is the theme for today. I hope that you walk away with that word. It is obvious who the believers are and who the deceivers are in this church 2,000 years ago. It is obvious because John has made it plain. There are people who love sin and hate Christians. And there are other people who love Christians and hate sin. And so it's not about the amount of your struggle. It's about the amount of hate. It's about the amount of love. And if God has poured his love in your heart, that's a whole lot of love. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. Now we're talking about murder. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So we're talking about a hate that leads to a murder. And specifically, we're talking about a hate of the church itself. Do you think any of these believers ever got murdered by church haters? Uh, yeah, the early church was persecuted pretty bad. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of bad deeds to good deeds. Is that what it says? No, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. What is the number one marker that we are in Christ? There is a love for the church, a love that is shared among other believers, right? A love between us. We, it doesn't mean it's all gushy all the time, all gushy and squishy, and we're sending each other Hallmark <laughs> cards all day long. It'd be good for Hallmark, wouldn't it? But it means that there is a nature change and that your heart connects with mine and my heart connects with yours because you're in Christ and so am I. Paul says it's an aroma, a fragrant aroma of life to life. And then when you're with an unbeliever, perhaps at some point after much conversation, you might even sense that there's an aroma of life to death because they still need Jesus. They're empty and they need him. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Somebody says, no, it's not that bad. It's just hate. It's not murder. Well, Jesus says anger is murder and hate is murder. The whole thing is about an evil heart from an unbeliever. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. What about all those Christians? What about all those Christians on death row right now? Murderers. You know what? They're not murderers. They're children of God who committed the sin of murder. But they've been washed. They've been justified. They've been sanctified. One of them, today, if you fast forward Paul 2,000 years later, one of them would have been Paul. Saul of Tarsus, murderer of Christians. He might be on death row were he to have lived that life in our culture today. Wouldn't surprise me at all if he were on death row for those murders. You get the point. The point is we had a former identity. We were haters. We were gossips. We were slanderers. We were drunkards. That was our identity. We might still struggle with some of those things. But our identity has changed. We've been washed. We've been justified. Gavin got a cat yesterday. His name is Timbit. Okay? <laughs> now, Timbit, uh, yeah, you don't know what Timbit is, but it's a Canadian donut hole. Uh, yeah. No joke, it's a Canadian donut hole. Uh, and, you know, you go to Canada, you go to Tim Hortons, and if you want a donut hole, you have to ask for a, a Timbit, okay? Now, they don't come in singles. You've got to get a dozen Timbits or more, I think. So, you know, cats are peculiar animals, and we've had our cat one day and listened to him whine all night. <laughs> but my wife told me the story yesterday of a cat, a cat who was emotionally disturbed. Someone she knows adopted this cat. And this cat had already lived a full life, but it was an abusive life. I mean, this cat struggled big time. We don't know all the details, but it was abused in many ways. 
And so this new owner tried to deal with this cat, a victim of abuse, and it went on for a, a year, two years. This cat would never come around humans. He would run and hide under furniture. There was no relationship because there was fear and abuse in his past. So, you know, this gentleman, he did the natural thing. He went to a cat whisperer. <laughs> and so he went to this cat whisperer and uh, he said, what should I do? And of course, the cat whisperer had the perfect advice. He said, change his name. He said, change his name. And the guy said, change his name. What is that going to do? He said, you watch. You just change his name. You give him a new name and you start calling him by that name. Within six months or so, that cat was a totally new cat. That cat had a new identity. That cat had a new name. And as a result, that cat began to act differently. Now, fellow felines, <laughs> you've got a new name. You've got a new identity. It is deeper than the name. It goes to the nature. It goes to the core of who you are. Meow, that's something to celebrate. I don't know. I don't know. It just came to me. <laughs> that's going viral. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for others, for the brethren specifically. Does that mean run out as a martyr, look to uh, jump in front of bullets or something? No, the point is you have the one who sacrificed his life living in you. We talked about marriage on Wednesday. We talked about the word submit and how many women are afraid of the word submit. And we pointed out how in marriage there's a verse that comes before that. It says, submit to one, submit to one another. Uh, if I give up my life for my spouse and they give up their life for me, if we submit to one another, then that word is not so scary anymore. Yeah, there's roles. We got to play roles in life, but there doesn't have to be fear in those roles. The fear dissipates when there is mutual submission, a giving up of one another for the other person. And that is what he's talking about here, laying our life down for one another. Do we do it perfectly? Do we do it well? Does it take time? All of that, of course, it takes time. It's growth. It's learning. It's the renewing of the mind. But how beautiful it is, this picture that he has painted for us, that we have the one inside of us who will live his life through us and give us those attitudes we need, give us those responses we need. All right, we'll finish up here. It says, whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? These are the people 2,000 years ago that are haters. They're saying, I love you, but I'll do nothing for you. I love you, but I don't even believe Jesus came in the flesh. I love you, but I say I've never sinned a day in my life. I love you, but behind your back, I hate the church and I'm going to plot its demise. These were the Gnostics. These were those influenced by that heresy. These are the deceivers, not the believers. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him. And whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So he's saying it's one thing to tell people, I love you, I love you, I love you. It's another thing. It's another thing to serve somebody and act on that love. We will know that we're of the truth because there's a heart assurance. You know, Paul says there's a test. There's nothing wrong with the test, but it's a simple test. He says this is the test. Does Christ live in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Does Christ live in your heart? A simple question. And if you have Christ living in your heart, you know the answer. He is guiding you not to yesterday's performance. He is guiding you to the present day question. Right now, does his spirit bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God? Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. 
Two things worth talking about here. First of all, we can have confidence before God and and we receive whatever we ask. Are you kidding me? So I just bow my head or maybe I do like people on the internet. I just say the magic words. I just, you know, tack on in Jesus name to the end of the prayer and I can speak this into existence and I can claim this and I can gab it and grab it. You know, this sort of theology is rampant. Is that what he's saying? Just ask whatever a Lamborghini, five mansions, And no health issues ever again, Lord, in Jesus' name. And boom, it just happens. That's not what he's saying. He says, if our heart does not condemn us in this. Have you ever prayed something? I've had this happen to me. Have you ever prayed something? You prayed about a circumstance. And you couldn't put your finger on it. But your heart just said, you know what? That may not be the plan. That may not be the plan. I may be asking for something that is not the plan. See, Lord, I want you to take this away. Like Paul said, take this from me, take this from me, take this from me three times. And that wasn't the plan. And so our heart will align with what God is doing. Secondly, we see the word commandments and we think, well, we think Moses. Anytime we see the word commandments, we think Moses. You know how many times Moses has been mentioned in our series so far in this epistle? Zero times. Moses is not mentioned. He does not make an appearance. The commandments here are not Moses. Here they are. This is his commandment that we believe. Well, that's the doorway to salvation anyway. Is this oppressive? Is this burdensome? That we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. This is not burdensome, the Apostle John says. It's not oppressive. It's not difficult. It's not far off. It is etched on the lining of our hearts. Believe and love. That is what Jesus is doing in us. You say, what's he doing? What's he doing? I know the new covenant. I get grace now. I'm forgiven. I'm righteous. I get it. But what do I do? Well, what's written? What's written on your heart? Believe and love. So that's what we do. Love covers a multitude of sins. The one who keeps these commandments abides in him and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he's given us. We're in him or we're not in him. We've got his spirit or we don't have his spirit. We have his love poured in our heart or we don't. It's all about the contrast. All right, what did we see today? Deceivers. Do not know God. Deceivers practice sin. That's the practice they have, the one and only practice in order to get better at sin. Deceivers abide in death, live in death. They have no love, only hate. And believers, believers know God. Believers have a new practice. Believers abide in new life, God's life. Believers have God's love in them. So, is it obvious? It's supposed to be obvious. Let's thank our God. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word that it does not create confusion, but gives clarity. Father, we thank you for your word that it doesn't put us into the bondage of introspection, but it sets us free. Father, we thank you for the truth that we are in you and you are in us. And it is so very obvious that you have begun a good work in us and you're carrying it on. Father, we thank you that we are born of you, that we are new at the core, that we have an innate, inherent love for one another that we cannot get rid of. We can't shake it because that love is you abiding in our heart forever. We thank you, Father, for all these things. And it is a privilege to be your children. In Jesus' name, amen.